Hello, welcome again to my podcast and to my YouTube channel. Today, we're going to talk about something very unusual, at least even for me, as my audience knows, I am uh, trained in psychoanalysis, which we usually associate to dreams and interpretation of dreams and all of that because of our dear Freud, Sigmund Freud. And, but it's so hard to find anyone who even touches on this. Nobody talks about dreams. And I think they're so crucial to understanding emotions and what you're going through. You can actually under, if we could write down our, our lives in terms of a timeline of dreams, we would know what was going on with us at that period of time, if we do that. But dreams is one of those things that we just forgot about. We ignore it, we take it for granted. But today we have a very special guest who specializes in a very specific type of dream, grief dream. Dr. Joshua Black, thank you so much for being here with us. He's a psychologist. Well, actually, no, sorry. He has a PhD in psychology, which he just explained to me. It's very different. At least that's what the general public understands because he's not a clinical psychologist, but he does a lot of research on dreams. And it actually, Dr. Joshua, it started with a personal dream too, right? It has to do with your dad and after he died. So this is what we're going to explore today. We're going to talk about dream, the importance, the meaning of dreams, why some people dream, others don't, which is not true, but we're going to talk about that. Some people don't remember dreams, which is very different, but thank you so much for being with us and welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you for having me. And it's great to know that you're a fan of dreams in general. <laughs> well, do you do you have the same experience as me? People, we talk about dreams. I mean, even in school, when I was going to school and getting my master's and I would bring up dreams, not once during my program did they ever bring it up or talk about dreams. And the times when I tried to do that, they would say, sorry, Paula, that's not my area. Mm. Yeah, people just don't. In, our, in the Western culture anyways, just don't value dreams. And I think there's an issue there. But, you know, I say anyone who I think works with someone in therapy, if they start asking about their dreams, you see how it relates to their waking life. And when you start asking about these dreams after loss, you can definitely see how it relates to their waking life and how it's not only helping them in many ways, but also it can be very distressing and cause them great suffering that is actually impeding them working on their grief too. So that's why, you know, for me, there's, it's all, it was a shock for me when I realized there wasn't really any research that has been done on the topic because people have been dreaming of the deceased for probably longer than I can, I know about probably since the beginning of time. And there's a reason for it. Like it, we're remembering dreams for a reason. And these dreams also have a reason for existing or, you know, mm -hmm. like the body is so great at, you know, just, having things for our survival and like mm -hmm. who we are and what we do and dreams is our part of that and so i think it's weird for people to dismiss something that has probably been one of the major reasons why we've survived so long just mm -hmm. as humans yeah in some cultures too right? look at the indigenous people right for them yeah. dreams are signs right mm -hmm. well and and there's a lot of people who will dream of ancestors that will have deep meaning for them and they get lessons and they get trained on how to do things through these dreams. And that's why it's like, it's so, it's so bizarre that we don't value them. But when I look at maybe why this is the case, it's because we're so hardened to the research. And if the research isn't done on the topic, people mm -hmm. don't believe it doesn't it's exist, important. right? Kind of, yeah, kind of thing. And so, you know, for me, that's the whole reason why I'm excited because now research exists so people can't just put it to the side and say it's just your opinion no it's actually I've done a lot of research probably eight years worth of research so far on a topic that no one really knew much about and hopefully we'll talk about that some more and just the importance of it and now it just validates that it exists and the importance that we should be talking about this in any kind of session mm -hmm. as we move forward. Yeah. And you're right, uh, with all of my clients, I try to bring up dreams. Some of them say, no, I don't dream, right? Because that's one of the misconceptions we have. I don't have dreams <laughs> because we know everybody has dreams. Some remember, some others don't. But with many of them, Joshua, what happens to me is that they start bringing up 
these dreams. Oh, Paolo, sometimes they'll come in next following week. Oh, you know what? You mentioned that and now I'm starting to dream. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Is that it is funny. Well, that's the, the beauty of the mind where when they feel that there's a safe space to share a dream and someone's asking about it, all of a sudden they start, the mind says, oh, this is important now. And maybe there's information for that person to help me. And so they'll start remembering these dreams and it's, you know, it could be for them, but a lot of time these dreams are for the therapist to understand more of what they're going through because dreams are great, but they they can be so bizarre in nature that people don't even know what they even represent. But a therapist would definitely see the connections with waking life mm -hmm. and can help and know which direction to go in therapy because there's so many different ways. But if you, if the mind's telling you that we need to look at this, well, you know, that's an important starting block to help that person. Yeah, yeah. Let's just go back because I started asking you about your personal dream that started your interest. So can we just go back a little bit and can you talk to us about that? Of course. <laughs> and so <laughs> now you're me... going to be my client, Dr. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Please be kind and gentle. So, <laughs> so when I was in undergrad, that's when my story started when it comes to these dreams after loss. So I was in my fourth year, it took me five years to finish my undergrad, but so I was in my fourth year and, and all of a sudden my dad died. Mm -hmm. And it was such a shock to me because I never experienced a significant loss in my life. And the, the emotions that I felt were so foreign and very scary because mm -hmm. I just started crying like, uncontrollably and I couldn't stop it and it was mm -hmm. probably the first time I cried in years I can't remember the last mm -hmm. time I cried when that happened yeah oh I was a good male you know I really sucked it up <laughs> I know be a man right <laughs> yeah and so you know it just broke something broke in me I just like just fell in the state but I was crying and my mind was racing I remember I wanted to drop out of school and like and use all the money that I got from OSAP, which is like a student loan thing, and and, mm -hmm. and fly fly to Israel because that's his last plan that we had together to almost try to memorialize him. But which was great because my what was great about where I was at the time is I had a partner who basically said, you know, calm down, you know, let's work through your grief first, and after you're done your your undergrad, then go to Israel or, or do whatever you need mm -hmm. to do. And so you know, I did the funeral. And I cried in the funeral. And I'm saying this because the next day after the funeral, I didn't cry anymore. And mm -hmm. everything turned gray. I had no real emotion at all, it's the best way to put it. Like all the wow. color came out of my world. So I wasn't having any joy or, or sore. I just went back to school, went back to work as if like nothing almost happened. And you're just like doing it because you need to do it but I couldn't feel anything. Like it was such a weird, such a weird time in my life because I've never been in that place again, but I went through it. And for three months, I was, I just thought this is what happens after loss. This is where you go mm -hmm. through. So I wasn't trying to change it. I thought this is just how it is. And you just do what you need to do to, to make it through. And then I had this dream and I wasn't asking for it. And I didn't even really even understand that it existed. You know, looking back, I realized it's in a bunch of movies that I watched back in the day, but at that moment, it wasn't something I was even longing for. And so the dream was I was in my, on my, sitting on my bed and I saw my dad at the end of the end of my room and he was looking through some of my stuff and I walked up to him and I said, you know, I'm, I'm going to miss you acknowledging the loss. Yeah. And then I said that I loved him and we hugged and, you know, wow. When I woke up, something changed within me. And I still, to this day, not, I have no idea what happened, but it wasn't interpretation that changed me. It was the dream itself that changed me. Cause when I woke up, the color was back. I was feeling something that I haven't felt in like three months. Wow. And I just sat in my end of the bed, just wondering what just happened because how, like, how could something in such a small amount of time change me so drastically? It didn't make sense to me on, on how it was. It wasn't a gradual change. It was like a light switch went on in a way. Mm -hmm. And when I look back at that dream, a couple things really stand out. So just looking at my grief, one thing was I wasn't able to say goodbye because he died so suddenly. And so mm -hmm. being able to say goodbye was a big thing. 
But I never said the last time I told him I loved him, like being a, a, a male in this society was probably when I was like five. Like, and he never said it to me either. Like, so it was just one of those things that was just maybe implied, I guess. But um, we just never said it. And like, there's something there about the value of saying that to other people. And it's probably a part of being vulnerable to say that and going against the norms. And then the third thing that from this dream was how amazingly peaceful it was and how peaceful my father was. My father had a lot of issues with alcohol and emotion regulation. And he just wasn't the, you know, he wasn't a father growing up that um, was conducive to a healthy environment growing up, that's what I put it. Mm -hmm. And, but in that moment, his heaviness of life that I knew him always carrying wasn't there. He was peaceful. He was at, at peace with just, like, he just had this lightness to him. And so it was more than a memory to me because I never seen him in that state before. Mm -hmm. And so that in itself had its own power, I think, too of just being in a very loving environment with him. And we're both happy, right? We're both like mm -hmm. there together. So, you know, that was the dream that changed me. And I went back to school and I got good grades and, you know, I did everything I needed to do. And what's interesting, I never told anyone though. And oh, for something to be such a, a life-changing event in my life, to not tell anyone was really strange. But then I, I keep hearing that from other people. I'm like, I wonder why I didn't tell anyone. And I, I realized because I didn't want anyone to try to take that away from me. Because mm -hmm. a lot of people are really good at changing what you love into something that you should be afraid of or to minimize what you're proud of. Yes, your experience. Right? Yeah. yeah, and like people have a really bad job. People have a really poor job at just making a safe space for people to share in general. So mm -hmm. I think I just like held it in because it was mine. It was sacred. And I didn't want anyone to, to change that in a way. Mm -hmm. And so my journey just continues on. Like I was going to be an elementary school teacher. I finished school. I, I got in to be an elementary school teacher, but then I turned it down. Something wasn't feeling right. And which is really weird because I spent all my life really like trying to get that career. And then the moment my dad died, like he was the one that really encouraged that for many reasons. He said they had a good pension. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, so maybe because he died, I wasn't really as invested in it, but still I had nothing to go off of. Like my life was destined for that. So something else was within me that was just saying no. And so I, I didn't go through with that. And I wanted, so I tried to see what I could do with a psychology degree with an undergrad and not much to tell you the truth and nothing that I found meaningful anyways mm -hmm. and so to find meaning I started to volunteer with the bereaved and this is where the idea came about even like researching this stuff because they had a lot of questions mm -hmm. for me mm -hmm. when I was you know volunteering with, with helping people one-on-one -on -one and in group and I didn't know how to answer them it never came up in any kind of class I took and when I looked at the research to try to give them some understanding, there wasn't anything there that could mm -hmm. help them. And so in that moment, that's when I had the thought, could I research this? I never wanted to be a researcher. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and the thought scared me because I wasn't planning on that. And I wasn't really trained in that area. And, that, and so, but I said, you know what, like, what's the worst going to happen? You know, like, you just have to try and see what happens. Right. And so after I got the courage to, to go through with that and uh, apply and talk to some supervisors, I got, I actually got in, which was really surprising to me. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, you know, and I got into my master's and I had to go to a different school, do a PhD and I got in and why I'm really surprised, not only was it actually, mm -hmm. actually worked, like I actually was able to do it, but no one was studying this stuff. So like to be a pioneer in a field, people don't understand, like your supervisor needs to approve your studies you can't just yeah. go in and, and, and if no one has ever done it they look at just like mm, there is do? a reason why nobody did it right <laughs> <laughs> yeah or like they may say well i don't want you to study that i want you to study what i'm doing but at, at the end of the day we got the research done and we got some amazing findings and so here we well, are trying let's talk to... <laughs> let's talk about those findings then the first thing i want to ask you and i'm sure many of my listeners are now questioning themselves that, well, should I really continue listening because I don't have dreams or if I do, I don't remember them. So why is that? Why do you, what do you know about, why is that that people, some people remember dreams and others don't? That's still a mystery. <laughs> we, really? 
It is. Yeah, it is. We have theories, right? Like for that, but you can't see all dreams. And so, you know, what we do know is around 10% of the population doesn't remember dreaming at all. 10%? That's it? I thought it would be way more. Okay. No, 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 just 10%. (laughs) So 90, so maybe 90% of your listeners get it. (laughs) But, you know, but a lot of people, when it comes to the average amount of dreams people do remember per week is around one or two. So it's very Mm -hmm. small. And one of the reasons for that is because our culture doesn't value dreams. Mm -hmm. And when you value dreams, you actually tend to remember more of them. And so people who keep a dream diary and talk about their dreams, they're having a lot more dreams per week than on average. And so there, so what's interesting is, you know, dreams can be increased and decreased, right? Based on your, uh, your value of them or how much you, you want to remember them too. Mm-hmm. So it's, that's what's very interesting uh, about that. And so, you know, like when you look at just dreams, dream research in general, and what you find is that, you know, why should people care about this? Because dreams reflect our waking life and research has shown that in many different ways. And so dreams can be a, a really good tool for people to understand themselves because as much as we want to believe we are conscious of how we feel, we're not. <laughs> we are, you know, the mind's so great at telling us lies and making us believe something that we're not in many different fashions and avoiding truth. And so dreams help actually help us understand what the truth is and also problem solve in many ways. Mm-hmm. And, and process, right? When you're talking about your own dream, you say, well, I don't know what happened, but uh, I've, I've read, I'm sure you've read this more than once, but Why We Dream by Matthew Walker. It's a very good book. And it's one of the things that I learned with him is, and that's what happened to you and that's what happened through dreams. One of the major functions of dreams is to process emotions. Yeah. So that's, that's what happened to you. You said, I kept it in, I stopped feeling, but mm-hmm. doesn't mean the emotion wasn't there. You were just not processing it. And the moment you had that dream, you were able to process your loss. And that, that comes with a relief, right? Oh, yeah. And you, and you see it a lot. And it's, it's interesting, because that's why, like, even the negative dreams, a lot of people mostly have when it comes to just dreams in general, you know, you see it and you see how, you know, the mind is trying to work through a lot of your feelings and waking life, a lot of stuff you've seen. And, you know, especially in the pandemic, a lot of people are having a, not, a lot of negative dreams or dreams of, you know, being isolated and stuff like that. And it's just understand those feelings are not like from anywhere. They come from inside. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so by yeah. looking at dreams, we can actually learn so much more about who we are. And if we don't like that, then we can then change it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In, in your research, uh, you said that 10% don't remember dreams. What about oh, people research. who've lost, who've lost someone? Let's let's dive into now grief dreams. So for okay. those who lost someone, and is that the same number, or do they usually dream about the deceased or not? Because in my personal experience, I've lost my brother and I've lost my dad, and I hardly ever. I don't think I ever had a dream with my brother, and with my dad a few, but not as many. And mm. I am. I'm one of those people who dreams every single day I wake up telling my dream because I remember oh, cool. them very vividly. And I'm always talking about my dreams. But of course, at the same time, I've always been, uh, not always, but I think after I started studying psychoanalysis and everything, I started really paying attention to my dreams. And after a while, you're so trained in it that you re- I remember details, I remember colors, I remember the other day I sent a message to a friend in Brazil because I had a series of three dreams, horrible nightmares by the way, wow. but of three dreams continue, it, that had never happened to me, continuous dream that I would wake up and go back and something even more horrible would happen and I would wake up again and then it would continue and I, I had to call him and say, listen, tell me, are you okay or something? Because My goodness, they were so vivid, but I remember, but with my dad, I really hardly ever had dreams with him or my, or my brother at all. And, you know, there's, it's interesting to think about, and there's a lot more research we need to do, but when we look at the, some of the dreams people do have, so I looked at different groups in my PhD and one of them was spousal loss. Mm -hmm. And what I, what I found was 86% of those pe- of you know those people that sample had a dream of their the deceased within a year or two 
Uh, mm -hmm. So that's a lot. So if you remember that 10%, that's almost any, everyone had at least one dream of the deceased. After pet loss, after six months, what's interesting, it was 78%. And that would increase as time goes on, of course. And then the next one was pregnancy loss. So like miscarriage and stillbirth, it was 58%. And that was within the first year. And what I just want to like mention there, they're dreaming of a child that they've never saw before. So I think that's uh -huh. fascinating. I had no idea what to expect in, in that one, but it's really interesting. And so I just want to sort of really move towards, you know, why these dreams may be a little special to people. And so as we sort of talked about, most dreams people have are negative in nature, just because of the anxiety and worry that people normally have before bed and what they watch, like they're watching the news or something. I know. You, if you watch the news, there's no way you won't have a nightmare. No. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's true. It's true. And so after trauma, you have even, you know, the research has shown that you have even more negative dreams that's more consistent you know, across time. And so when you think after grief, you would have more negative dreams of the deceased. But what's really interesting is people have more positive dreams of the deceased after loss. And they it do? goes, okay. yeah, and it, so it goes against typical dream understanding, the best way to put mm. it. And mm. so when you look at the numbers, they're actually quite fascinating. So within, let's say, just that spousal loss group uh, or partner loss, what you find is that 90 or 90% of the sample had at least one positive dream of deceased and, and around 40% had a negative dream. But what's interesting is those who had a negative dream tended to also have a positive dream, like almost like 90% of them. So most people who had a negative dream also had a positive dream. Okay. And so the theory goes is people probably have negative dreams earlier on. And as they process some of those emotions and they'll have more positive dreams moving forward. It makes total sense, doesn't it? Because in the beginning, there's so many negative emotions, you know, that mm -hmm. depending on how they died, but the shock and the frustration and the anger many times, the anxiety, and what am I going to do without that person? But with time, as it progresses, then you that it, it becomes a little bit, not, not easier, but with time, it does dissipate a little bit of these negative emotions. You see that you are going on without them, that your life goes on. And, and that's, again, reflected in your dreams, right? Because yeah. as you said, and as Sigmund Freud said very early on, it has to do with what's happened. Part of the dream has to do with what's happening in your life at that time. Yep. And, but what's interesting, so like, that's why you would expect a lot of negative dreams, but like, there's that problem solving aspect going on where these dreams change people like it did me. So like, it's very strange that they are positive, but they are helping in many ways that even though the person's still grieving and mm -hmm. there's these dreams help them as it, to move forward in many different ways. And they're still, because, you know, I said like 90% are having these positive dreams and maybe 50 had, let's say 50 had mm -hmm. positive dreams. 50% of positive dreams to start with, that's still a lot of people having positive dreams in the midst of great sorrow. Yeah. And so they never had that negative dream that then went to positive, it was just positive right away. Yeah. And I'm still trying to understand a little bit about that because you uh -huh. can have two people, let's say similar scores of grief or trauma, and let's say they're dealing with guilt. One person has a dream that reflects the guilt. So the deceased is maybe making them feel even more guilty or mm -hmm. they can't, you know, they can't save them like they, they wish they could. Oh, another dream, you have a deceased telling them there's nothing could have done and that it's okay. And so relieving that, so that comfort, guilt. Comfort. Yeah, and so yeah. You know, why is that? So we did look at you know some of the research and you know trauma is a part of that conversation on unresolved feelings of guilt or blame. I will have more of these negative dreams, but still, there's still a lot to be known about, you know, why would someone have a positive dream over a negative if they're both dealing with guilt and that's something that you know future research needs to really look at and longitudinal research would be really beneficial in that area yeah does it show up one of a curiosity of mine now does it have to anything to do with the relationship itself does it, it does. for example do they have dreams so that they can repair a relationship that wasn't that good <laughs> actually it's interesting because you know, when you look at just you know we looked at who reports positive dreams and people with more of a secure attachment style, uh, those with uh, a better sort of connection with the deceased would have more positive dreams, which makes sense because if you have a rocky relationship that could show up in a dream. But I have seen really, really amazing dreams where the deceased was, they had a lot of conflict. They really didn't, they hated each other for, uh, for the most, best way to mm -hmm. put it. 
but yet these dreams rebuilt the relationship. Like they, they're offering forgiveness in a way, or they ask mm -hmm. for forgiveness in a way. And that helped with that. And then so the individual then, so the dreamer or the bereaved, I guess, mm -hmm. is now a different bond with the deceased because of the dream. And so it changed. I think that's a really amazing thing when it comes to the power of continuing bonds and how we work through our grief. And we know that it can be a very important part of that. And that's just like maintaining a bond with the deceased in whatever way you feel. So it could be, you know, talking about them or just reflecting on them, you know, looking at pictures, or it could be for those people, you know, feeling their presence, seeing coins, you know, butterflies, that sort mm -hmm. of thing. Yeah. It's all sort of very similar thing, but these dreams help play a role in that and fostering that within us. Yeah, you know, you were, I, I was reading your part of your research and you talked about uh, people who dream before the death happens. Sometimes it's anticipatory because they know, sometimes they know that it's coming or sometimes they don't even know. And I have a personal experience that, that was at the time very spooky to me. I was around maybe 17 years old and I was at a friend's house and we were talking, she had, you know, girly talk we we're talking about this ex-boyfriend of his and we went to bed <laughs> yeah they were having problems conflicts and everything and i was there for the night and we went to bed and in the middle of the night i wake up with her shaking me and she was crying compulsively mm -hmm. and i i was really scared i said what happened what happened and she said he died i heard him cry and i heard him scream my name i'm sure something happened to him and, you know, for me, I, I don't have these beliefs. I don't doubt it because that would be kind of uh, arrogant on my part. We don't know what's out there, but I'm, I'm not a believer in these things. And I was really, but I was really touched because she was desperate. And I, you know, I was comforting her. So maybe it was just a, you know, a bad dream. It was just a nightmare. She said, no, Paula, I'm telling you, I heard him, he was crying my name, something happened and she was shaking. And anyway, we went back to bed next morning we wake up with the news that he had died at that time in a car accident how bizarre is that right it makes you sit in the mystery of life and that's what these dreams really do for me and i i hope other people can sit in that too and i think there's like i've heard that story multiple times it's definitely more rare than like mm -hmm. than anything right but they do they do happen and like how can we make sense of that and the best way to for me, it's like, it, it could be, yeah, it could be like out of this world visitation dream, or there could be a connection that we have with people that goes beyond what we think we have. Like there could be a bond or a cord for those that we love. And we just have a feeling when something's off and then maybe you make a dream, you know, with that. But like, I, I hear that with mothers where they just know when a child is in danger or not feeling well, they'll call and, and that sort of thing. So maybe that, you know, our love for people is like some type of connection that we have that goes beyond, you know, I guess, distance. I don't know, but it's very interesting because it goes against what we would think would happen. And, you know, these dreams, they, uh, they, they definitely make you sit in the mystery just with that. But there's also, you know, and, and I want to say too, there are these dreams where the deceased will just say goodbye like they would in waking life. Or I mean, after after you know that they're, they're, they're dead, you'll have these comforting dreams where the deceased says they love you and they're saying goodbye kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Well, you're also having those dreams before the person even knows that they're dead. And you know that for me is very interesting how both the, the themes are very similar and what is uh, actually moving forward. It's interesting how your friend had the dream of them dying because I, I see more of the positive images of that. Uh -huh. So that's why I said I'll see more. Someone will tell me about a dream where the deceased is saying goodbye. They wake up, they call, and the person died in the night when they had that dream kind of thing. So it's more of that positive quality. But I like if anyone has a negative dream, I would probably go towards it's just a fear or something because that's what fear dreams look like. Yeah. Um, the more the positive dreams is very unique and very different. You can weed that out from anxiety because it's something different is going on and, you know, to check in on them, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it, but right? the anticipatory that you mentioned in your research is easy yeah. to understand. I mean, you're anxious, you are waiting for that to happen. Sometimes yeah. it's a long-term, you know, disease and the, you know, terminal illness and, you know, and you start dreaming of them, of them dying, right? Yeah. That's, that's, but what happened to my friend was just to me unbelievable and until today yeah. i say i am not 
I'm not going there because it's not my area. That's way be that's way beyond anybody's area, really. Yeah. But it happened, and I can't deny yeah. it happened, right? No, and there's I think there's a lot of beauty in sitting in the mystery, and that's really what it does. And as long as the individual doesn't have any distress over it, because sometimes when people have those experiences, they feel that they could have done something if they feel it was like earlier than the actual death kind of thing. But um, at the end of the day, it's just, you know, people will just carry that with them. And I think that's, that's okay. You know, like there's a mm -hmm. lot, and there's a lot about life I don't understand. I look at a bird and I'm like, how do you fly? <laughs> I know. <laughs> and, right? It's just like, there's so much, even me, like, how do I even look at myself and think these things and just be here? It's just, I don't know, but I can sit in the beauty of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's talk about, there's, uh, you talk about, so that's before the person dies. And then after they die, there, there are other types of, you know, that's what research does, right? Categorizes stuff. <laughs> So, but let's talk about that. So you can dream with, with the person present. And sometimes I've had many, many of these dreams and I'm sure my mm -hmm. listeners do. Dreams and doesn't even have to be death related, but you know, and you wake up and say, you know, it wasn't you, but it was you. Sometimes it's somebody else, but the symbol is when, when you feel that, you know, it's so funny, it wasn't, it was you in the dream, but it didn't look like you. And that can happen with grief dreams too, right? Um, I haven't heard of that too often, but mm -hmm. it's just based on people's, I guess, dreams that they do have. I said, I haven't seen everything. Most of my studies have just been on dreams of the deceased, but I have seen some, when it comes to just like, say like there's, there's all sorts of variations of dreams and people have their own unique style of dreaming. And that's sort of with you, it probably, you may see it more often than maybe someone else. Because, it, you know, dreams represent who we are, also our personality style and, and all different other things. And, you know, so, but one of the themes that maybe you would probably relate most to is the dreams that don't have the disease present in it at all. Mm -hmm. And it's just more reflective of your waking life in some way. So I could see, see that. Um, but yeah, usually when the deceased is in the dream, people know that, mm -hmm. like, they are who they are and the other person is mm -hmm. usually who they are yeah. too. Like, I've only seen a couple of times where the deceased is like a cloud or a bird. But for the most mm -hmm. part, deceased is the deceased. They may just change in age and like how they look, but other than that, they usually are who they are. Mm -hmm. So, so mainly most, most of the times they, they show up as themselves. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably, well, if, if the goal is for them to feel better, it's probably <laughs> makes sense why they're showing up as themselves. <laughs> yeah. Have you heard of many people who had this, the experience you had that after that, everything changed and it, it was yeah. like a shifting point in their grief? So many people. And that's why, you know, one of the reasons why I wanted to start the podcast, like my own podcast, mm -hmm. just because people were having these experiences and you can't really capture that through the quantitative data. But this, like by having a conversation, you really have the, the impact that it actually had on someone. It can change someone's life. Like it did with me. I had people, you know, that would talk to me and, and, and say it was the thing that they clung to, to get through their loss. Other people said that I remember, um, I had a couple of stories that they were even thinking about ending their own life. And yet this, they had a dream that actually encouraged them to not to do so. And that wow. definitely changed it. Other changed. people were addicted to drugs and they had one of these dreams and all of a sudden they sort of got off the drugs. It was a catalyst for them to get their life back in order. And so like, there's, a, there's so much when it comes to what these dreams can do for people. And when we look at dreams in general, people mostly forget their dreams soon after they wake up. But with a lot of these dreams, they have such an impact. People remember them for their entire life. And that could be the positive dreams, which are, mm -hmm. you know, are great, but also the negative dreams. If people don't understand them or if they, if they cause any kind of um, conflict in their journey, people remember mm -hmm. those too. Like I remember an individual who came up to me um, at a conference and she said, I had this dream when I was a kid, my sister died. And I, it was so, it kept repeating. I still don't know what it is this day, but you know, can I tell you? I said, yes, of course. Mm -hmm. And so she told me, and she must've been like 60 now. So this was like 55 years later, she's telling the story. And she's like, yeah, I can still feel and remember what it felt like. And the dream imagery was so vivid, but her uh, Barney Rubble of the Flintstones, it's a cartoon. Yeah, and anyways, so, you know, okay. Barney <laughs> with that voice of his, yeah. <laughs> so Barney was dragging uh, the sister by the hair through the hallway and then they would jump and escape into this painting and she was so devastated wow. and horrified by that every time she woke up 
And she's like, do you know what that means? I said, well, it's the first time I've seen the Flintstones in a grief dream. <laughs> but I said, well, like, let's just talk about the grief and what happened. I said, you know, you know, did, were, did you, were you able to attend the funeral? And she said, no. I said, did anyone ever talk to you about what happened to your sister? And she said, no, she was there one minute and gone the next. I said, well, then this, this dream makes perfect sense to me. Your mind is trying to find a way to make sense of what happened. Why is your sister missing? Like, where did she go? Well, Barney Rubble took her, right? So it's just, it gives it answer. something. It's an answer. Yeah. It may seem, may seem crazy, but at least it's an answer. And if you look in your own life, we give ourselves answers to a lot of solutions that aren't correct, but it definitely helps calm the mind down a lot. And so I understand that, especially for a kid. And so it actually gives the importance of talking about death to children. And so, because if not, they may make up some stuff and also talk about their dreams because there's a lot of insights that you can get from them. And I should mention, there was a study done that found 55% of children who had a parent die had a dream of the deceased. Um, wow. so like that that's so parent yeah it's a lot so a lot of people from all age groups are having dreams of the deceased and it's just like how can we make sense of it and how can we use discernment when we talk about the interpretation of it because that is something else that can cause a lot of people great suffering even if it's a positive dream based on how they just interpret it mm -hmm. yeah, and also just to to clarify that you had that dream that changed your life and sometimes it happens to people but it can be a long-term thing and that's why it's so important for example to bring it into therapy right it happened to me i had a recurrent dream forever years and years and years very bad dream mm -hmm. uh, that happened over and over again and one day i was lucky enough to have a psychoanalyst as a therapist then now i saw him for two years and he immediately said, okay, let's talk about this dream. And we started talking and every, every week I would bring up the dream. Mm -hmm. And finally, I, it, was, it was such a powerful uh, for me experience because I found resolution through, that, through those mm -hmm. dreams. And after we interpreted and we finished this resolution phase, I never had that nightmare ever again, not until yes. today. And this was like 20 something years ago. That's beautiful. And I think that's just, you know, to be able to share and, and work through and understand your dream is very beautiful if, if people provide that space, that safe space to do so. I said it's not as common, training is as isn't as common as it probably should be. No. But like if you can find that person, that's great because working, understanding the imagery, you can then work on it in waking life. And then once you work through whatever you're trying to work through in waking life, well, there's no need for the dream anymore. But the, as you know, there's another way of working through nightmares too, is you know, dream rescripting. And that's changing basically the ending of the dream to something more positive. That has been seen to work also because it can be very time consuming to work through your emotions yeah, in waking yeah. life. Can you, so, can you give an overall <laughs> of this uh, uh, dream restructuring or rescripting? Just so my yeah. listener, because I'm, I'm sure there are many people now listening and I want to go into that too, how to stimulate remembering dreams and everything but how can you do that what is the that, that what does that that technique sound like and how can they do this Risk yeah so whatever like so the big issue with a lot of these dreams is the distress that they have afterwards and so a lot of people try to avoid that distress so what you want to do is change the dream so it's something more positive so you don't actually avoid it anymore but you can think about it and smile so for example let's say you're being chased by someone you don't know but you're just like panicking you wake up out of breath what can you do so you can change it by saying okay i'm being chased being chased oh actually i'm gonna turn around and see who's chasing me and lo and behold it's a giant you know care bear <laughs> and it just wants to hug and so we hug and we dance and you know and then that's the dream so now the dream is that whole thing and so it's a positive dream now and so when you think about that dream research has shown if you do it for within a four week and you think about that dream before bed, you're not going to have that negative nightmare anymore. There's definitely a re there's a significant reduction and you may not even have that dream. It may just work itself out. So that's such a quick and simple tool to be able to do. And other things you can do is even add a character in the dream and then just change what happens within the dream. So what you're just really trying to do is just work through that dream and waking life. So it's just not distressful. Mm -hmm. And what's really interesting is by working on the dream, you're also working on your issues in waking life because it, it's not one direction, it's bi-directional. And so that's kind of cool too. So, you know, at the end of the day, it's just understanding that there are ways to work for this, but also understand that there is meaning in this. So as much as you want to get rid of the dream, 
I always try to get people to understand where is it coming from first? And then that gives you the clue. So if you don't deal with it, you're just going to get a different nightmare <laughs> or something else yeah. moving on. Uh -huh. So let's really work with that and see what's it trying to tell us? Because once it tries to tell us something, the mind's really good at saying, well, I don't need to tell you anymore. You're already working on it. So like, we don't need to sort of, I can give you something else. So that's how I sort of see dreams. I see so, dreams as like our best yeah. friend telling yeah. us the truth. And then once we yeah. acknowledge the truth, it doesn't need to say it anymore. Yeah, I love that you say it's bi-directional because it's not just about let's process the emotions of what's happening in your life through the dreams, but let's change what's going on in your life also through the dreams that you have, right? By looking at them and, and trying to explore why am I dreaming about this? This is mm -hmm. what I do. And in, in, uh, of course, after years and years, and I'm sure you do the same, you become so good at it today. When I have a weird dream that I can't understand, I just sit and say, okay, what's going on in my life right now? Why, am I, why did I feel this? Why did this character show up? And I start connecting the dots and you become really good at it. And it's really quick. Sometimes yeah. you go, oh, okay, I get it. Okay, I get, I get the dream now. Yeah, it takes time to understand your own dream language. And that's sort of the, the issue I think a lot of people have is they have these dreams, they're probably very important, but like they Google online or they get a dream dictionary and it doesn't gonna, it's not gonna give them no, anything. No, 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 don't get those books. That's the first thing I say. You know, that's interpretation of dreams, unless it's of course Sigma Freud's, but that, but still all but those books then, that you have. But even then, they would be able to understand that, it. No, 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 <laughs> because only you, that's the one thing I always tell my yeah. clients, only you can interpret your dreams. I yeah, can guide you through that yeah. and I can look at things that maybe you're not seeing, but only you will be able to tell because your life, it's your life, not mine, right? Yeah, your symbols are different than, you know, even though we're dreaming the same things, we have different experiences yeah. with those symbols in waking life. So yeah, and that's why I tried to put that out there too, just in case people go that way to try to understand, but it's not, yeah. it's not the way to gain understanding. Okay, let me ask you something else. So we're almost finished, but I want to <laughs> ask about, about that. I know, I know, we can talk for hours because it's a passion for both of us. But what about those people who say, no, but I don't dream. Is there a way that you can stimulate having dreams or remembering? Because again, you do dream, first of all. Yeah, you, yeah, dream. You, you, you just yeah. don't remember it. It's part of your sleep pattern and your sleep cycle. You mm -hmm. dream, everybody does. But how can you stimulate remembering dreams? I think we talked about a little of this before. It's, it's really about valuing the dreams, writing them down, talking to other people, even listening to this podcast can trigger you to have a dream. And you're just trying to train yourself now to sort of say, these are, these are valuable to me. So I want to remember these. And another tool too is because we're dreaming in a different state of consciousness, one of the things that happen is when we're in, when we wake up, the dream fades really quickly. And so rather than trying to think about what you need to do during a day to keep your eyes closed and to rehearse the dream so you can go into short-term memory. So when you wake up, you can then write it down. And so it's very important to do that because I think a lot of people will realize, oh, it's, that was such a great dream. I can't wait to tell someone. They go have a shower. They forgot it. It's gone. And there's no way to retrieve it. It's somewhere in the mind, but they just can't retrieve it. And I think that's more of the issue than anything. But yeah, we're dreaming throughout the sleep in REM and in non-REM. And, you know, like that's, it's, it's still a mystery because, you know, we just can't see what dreams we're having. There's a lot, a lot of research that needs to be done in sleep and it's just so expensive. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, mm -hmm. um, that, you know, that's really what they, they can do to recall that. And so in my research, I looked at, you know, why are some people dreaming of the seas and others aren't? And I looked at a lot of different factors. And what's interesting was um, what factor replicated in both studies was dream recall in general. So people who recall more dreams in general will remember more of these types of dreams. And so what it's saying is basically, the more you remember your dreams, the more likely you're gonna catch one of these dreams. And so it's not that I don't think people are not having dreams of cease. I think they're just not remembering them based on their mm -hmm. frequency. Like any kind of part. dream, right? Because we yeah. know they have it. And, and yeah, that's very, very interesting. I, I was wondering, so is there a way to maybe for grief dreams, any technique to help them remember? And also, I was wondering if that has to do with the way you grieve, right? Because some people shut it down, said, no, I'm not going to think about them anymore. They're gone. And, and it has to do with your research, continuing bonds, right? Because it's so yeah. important to, I mean, you die, but you don't end the relationship. But the society we live in is about two weeks, right? Two weeks after two weeks, grief is done, continue your life, keep going. And 
and forget about the disease. So some people fall for that, unfortunately, but others, they, they want to hang on to the relationship. And, and maybe, I don't know, is there a relationship between the way you grieve? You either try to forget about them and put them aside, or you want to keep the, the bond and the relationship and you have a big, you still have the pictures, for example, around the house and you keep some of their clothes and is that related or does research look into that? I haven't looked at that in the sense of your intention to have these dreams, if that mm -hmm. plays a, a factor. I think it probably would, but I, I can't see it being a huge factor in that mm -hmm. because people are wanting these dreams and they're just not having them, right? Like even mm -hmm. people who have one, they want another. And it's like, sometimes all you get is one. And yeah. you know, that's- and some, you know, some people I'm sure are scared yeah. of them too. They don't want to dream with the disease, right? Because that's a scary thing sometimes. It can be, especially based on say like your religion stuff like that can impede that in many different ways. And so, but there are, there may be ways to almost incubate a dream. So dream incubation has been around for a long time. And so on my website, so griefdreams.ca, I have a form that it's called the Dream Builder Worksheet. And what it does is it helps you create a dream that you would want with the deceased in a part of it. And then if you rehearse that before bed, you're basically telling your mind that I want to, re if I dream of this, wake me up. <laughs> like I want to okay, remember this Let me know, dream. please. Yeah, exercise yeah. my memory muscle here. That's really yeah. what it is. And you know, like some people, it's like other people will pray and they say that worked um, mm -hmm. at a time. And so it's just yeah. really what you're doing is you're trying to incubate that dream. It's not gonna work all the time, but you may, it may help in a, in a way. To be able but to with, do that. with everything else, it's training, yeah. right? And it's repetition yeah. and it and it's you incorporating that into your daily routine, maybe. Because yeah. it is like everything else, it's exercise, right? You have to repeat, repeat, repeat. That's how the brain stores information, right? And brings it up to the surface sometimes. Mm -hmm. And doing it before bed, because research has shown, you know, what you watch and do, you know before bed it, oh, it tends, totally influences tends to influence you more more yeah. than anything else yeah your, your dream so talk that's... to joshua last question last question and i were talking to... about suicide dreams yeah <laughs> oh my god yeah we can have another another uh episode just for that yeah <laughs> that's what this it's is the... supposed to be <laughs> i know i know do you have anything like specific about suicide is it different? <laughs> Do, have you looked into yeah. it? Is it is it different? Really? Well, you can yeah, you can see just by because the questions are different, right? So these dreams really reflect the questions, the issues we go through, and when it comes to suicide, there's that why question. Yeah. Um. There's the mm -hmm. anger at the at the individual, um, that comes up, and you can see these dreams reflect that in many ways. And so when we look at the positive dreams, we can see that sometimes the deceased provides the answer to the question they're longing for about the why, and they, they'll give that in detail. And the individual can then understand a little bit more and better. Other times the deceased apologizes for what they wow. did and the, the person forgives them in the dream. So it releases that within them. And you know, other times they'll spend that time together and have that very beautiful moment. But with any kind of like suicide is very related to trauma. And I said like most people will that there is a link between trauma and these negative dreams. So there could be, they may be having more dreams of being helpless to a situation or dreaming of the, the death as it happened. I even seen as because a person wasn't even there for the death, but they are dreaming about what would have happened or what yeah. did happen. What um, about guilt? Yeah, guilt's in there too, right? Yeah. yeah, and so anything that, any of those common things that people are trying to process with, through suicide will come through these dreams. In either a very positive way in the sense of trying to relieve it or in a negative way and it's basically just reflecting what they're going through and i should mention that people just need to use discernment when looking at this stuff because um sometimes people will even take these negative dreams as visitations and mm -hmm. i always sort of strongly um to not do that <laughs> because mm -hmm. it just complicates yeah. your grief and it probably relates more to your waking day struggles. So once yeah. you deal with those, then let's see if it continues on and then we can make that decision. But before then, let's work on the, your waking life struggles. And I want to say- That's too, a great I, point. That's a great point. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And the other, the other theme I want to sort of make apparent is that um, I found in my research and, I've, and it's been found in cross-culturally that where there's this, there's this theme called come join me. And so this is where the deceased tries to encourage the person to take their own life um, very positively. So it's a positive dream, but the person's trying to convince them that this is the only way to be together. 
And, or there's these negative dreams where the deceased is dragging the person to almost the afterlife. And both mm -hmm. those kind of the themes are related to high, very high trauma. And so we know after suicide loss, that's one of those things for those survivors that it is, you know, it's, it's such a common thing um, to have high trauma and to understand we need to use discernment with that. And that could be a red flag for um, any kind of therapist to know that maybe there's suicide tendencies in there. There was a dream researcher, Patricia Garfield, who said that it was, it's linked to, in, in her own practice, she sees them, the, this type of theme linked to people who have uh, suicidal thoughts. Oh. And in a different culture, you can sort of see these dreams. And there's a myth that if you have one of these dreams, it's symbolic that you're going to die soon. So it's precognitive. Wow. Yeah. And really what it's, I think, saying is that the individual probably does die soon. I think people made that connection, but why? I think one of the reasons is people maybe do kill themselves. And um, the other reason, maybe they just have high trauma. And in that culture, if you're trying to hunt and gather and try to kill like animals and stuff, you're going to do a lot of mistakes because of you're probably not sleeping correctly. Your cognitive processes are off. Your reaction time's off. And so I can see that also happening to encourage that myth on, on, or that interpretation of that dream. But I think trauma is the biggest part of that to mm -hmm. really understand. And, and it's something that, you know, I've, and it's, it seems to be very rare. Like it was only, I've only seen it three times in all the thousands of dreams I've, con I've collected, but when I did find them, they were related to this high trauma. And, you, and so I think it's very important to understand that. Just use discernment when we look at these dreams, mm -hmm. if you're coming from a spiritual sense. Yeah, and even and even just the, the normal uh, longing to be with the person, right? So they came to me in a dream and they, they were talking about me dying too. And maybe as you said, mentioning you should take your life too, to be with mm -hmm. me. Sometimes that's just a representation or a reflection on, of, on how, how they feel, right? They want to be with them. Well, I haven't, well, probably, like I'm guessing that's what people are longing for. But a lot of people have that longing to be with that person but the dream isn't like that the dream is them hanging out or saying they love you or like they're not okay. trying to convince the person to take their life and so that's the the interesting thing and and so that, that's why it reflects more of uh issues within the struggles of their grief and to really watch out for those suicidal tendencies there because mm -hmm. you know it's not it's not a common theme at all yeah yeah and really have that conversation if it's a friend yeah. or a family member Okay, let's talk about that because sometimes they believe it and they will act out on the dream, right? Well, that's, I can understand how people probably have killed themselves because of a dream like that. Thinking that they were going to be together and maybe they were, I don't know what the afterlife's like, yeah, but that dream itself yeah. was a, probably a catalyst for that. As much as these dreams can save a lot of people, there are a lot of these dreams that can actually hinder people and I said harm yeah. people too. So, yeah. you know, that in itself it just allows, that's why the beauty of asking the question, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, information we can find from these dreams when people actually share them and this is one of them that could maybe save a life yeah maybe we could do some research together just on suicide itself hey there's there's so much I research have a that lot of people <laughs> there's so much research that needs to be done in this area just yeah. on like on yeah, any but it would topic. be interesting yeah it would interesting be, yeah. just to focus on suicide to see the you know the, the themes the topics that show up and the impact that it has on their lives is it more yeah. about comfort? Is it about, more about resolution? Is it scary? Is it something that haunts you? So Very it's good. so many different. Yeah, yeah. there's so many. I, I'm, I have had, a, had like, I think six people on my podcast who had had a suicidal loss. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting looking at their dreams and most of them were positive in nature. Some they're just telling, had negative dreams of the deceased. But yeah, like anyone... I said, like, by start asking questions, you'll see these themes pop up and it'd be very interesting to know how it relates to where, what their struggles are and, and where they are in their life. Because wow. is it just negative dreams or are they having these positive mm -hmm. dreams of the disease to try to help them at the same time? You know, mm -hmm. like, this is, this is what I see in the pandemic. And what's interesting about dreams over time is that in the beginning, it deals with your grief. But if you're sort of worked through some of that grief and let's say now you're in the pandemic, these dreams are now trying to help people work through the pandemic issues. So they'll, yeah. they're, they're asking about them, how they're doing, they're providing them problem solving solutions. They're just spending time to avoid that, some of that loneliness that they're going through. And then yeah. at end of life, these dreams change where they're trying to help people process letting go of the body and, and, and dying. And I think that's phenomenal. So these dreams 
change over time, which is also different from other dreams. And that is the mystery of it all. Why does it happen? I don't know, yeah. but it's very interesting. And I think more research needs to be done to really understand this because this is saving lives. So if we can understand more about these dreams, we could help people better in waking life, I think. Yeah, I listened to someone. I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can find it and I'll send it to you. Actually, a researcher who is doing specific research on dreams during the pandemic. And she yeah, already know, yeah. has, you, you, you know who it is? Yeah, yeah. You, okay. There's a couple of people. Yeah, there's a couple of people, okay. but they're not focusing on dreams of the deceased, but they're they're coming up with no, most. No, it's, no, it's about the pandemic. I and mean, what are you dreaming yeah. about? And just trying to relate to the emotions and everything. Yeah, a lot of, but a lot Dr. of isolation. But Dr. Joshua, <laughs> I know we have to talk, we have to finish this because, okay. just because. Please tell my audience <laughs> where they can find you in, in your podcast, you know, just so you know, he's my colleague in terms of profession and interest, but he's also a podcaster. So tell I my am. audience where to find you. So if they go to griefdreams.ca, that's where you can find all the information really needed. And on there, you can find, uh, I have a online Grief Dreams course people could take to find out more information on this. It's about 10, almost 10 hours. So we barely covered the surface with this conversation. And then uh, also have one-on-one -on -one Grief Dreams consultations on there. So if people want to cool. know a little more information, Excellent. yeah. Well, when you see so many dreams, it's so easy to sort of connect the dots for people, which is nice. And then I have the Grief Dreams podcast and then the social media links. So Instagram, at Grief Dreams, I, I, po like I really post a lot of dreams that people share. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then, you know, Twitter and Facebook, I have some stuff on there those. too. But also I want to say, I just started uh, a couple clubs in Clubhouse. And so I'm really excited for that. And so I have a Grief Dreams Club and a Grief Cafe. So if they want to you know, follow me there, cool. that'd be great. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the name of the podcast, you said it very fast. It is the Grief Dreams <laughs> Podcast. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You went like blah, 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 like a bullet to the mic. I don't that. know how much time we had left. <laughs> <laughs> well, Joshua, thank you so much for your time. Such wonderful. We have to talk about suicide dreams because I, I can give you what's most precious people, right? The, uh, the, the answers that you need because I can just post it on my social media, especially in Brazil and and we can try to find some people to answer the questions and participate in the research. So we'll talk about that later. But anyway, thank you so much for your participation, for your time and sharing your knowledge with us. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it.